really at the end of the day, it's just the matter of a macro market. It's just what happens. That's why it's really important to have a plan, have a plan and understand what your goals are. In fact, my camel out there is suffering right now with a broken back. So I actually found Pepe when it was only a couple of hours old and I'm like, oh, this is a funny meme. Oh my God. <laughs> Yo! <laughs> Who is this DJ? The old man is swing trading over years at a time. And it's like, that's where the real money is made. The answer is a permanent loss. With single side of staking, you don't have to worry about a permanent loss. If you're aware, if you're disciplined, you can hone that into further financial growth. Financial freedom. So we can actually live life and not have to be constantly living paycheck to paycheck. I mean, that's the ultimate goal, more or less, right? Welcome to Book Club episode number 16. I am Zenith hosting as always, and this week we are covering Thinking in Bets by Annie Duke, former professional poker player. But first, we have something to celebrate. You see, we crossed a little milestone called 1K subs. So we got it. Woo! <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Wow, that was a lot less fizzy than I thought it was going to be. Absolutely <laughs> thank you to everyone out there for continuing to support us this entire time. Uh, if you had told me that we would reach a 1,000 subs at this point in our career, I would not have believed you. But I got to say, feels damn good, and hats off to everybody out there. My panelist, are you there? Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. This is awesome, bro. What uh, What is that bottle of bubbly you got there? That's not... um. That's not Martinelli's, is it? No, this is a uh, a beautiful Corbell Brute. It is a uh, you know fancy twelve bucks a bottle or something. I paid for it, but either way, excellent. It's a day for celebration. We're happy to be doing so. And I definitely just scared the crap out of my cat. So sorry, Lily. That's that's <laughs> okay. She'll be fine. So oh, that is kick ass. I love it. No problem. <laughs> I do want to give a shout out to everybody that's in the chat already. I know our Friday shows aren't some of the most popular. However. This beats the hell out of just talking into the void by myself. So, first off, we got Centurion Fifty Four X. He said, "Good evening, DJs. Thank you very much for showing up. You come to so many of these. We appreciate all the input and all the comments from you. It's really a pleasure having you." And then, on top of that, we have the biggest cheerleader in the entire crypto space, and definitely the number one cheerleader for us. And that is none other than Tam Tam. Thank you so much for tuning in and. Commenting and sharing as always. She's actually even trying to help us out with some networking on Twitter as we speak right now. <laughs> After that, we got another member coming on hopefully soon. We got Farmer J, aka Brown310 in the chat. He says, save some of that. Don't worry, I have an entire another bottle that I'm pretty sure we're going to be cracking open on the, on the Sunday show. So we are not going anywhere. If you have any last chats or comments you want me to read out on stream, please put them down in the comments below. And we want to thank each and every one of you guys for being part of this journey and helping us get where we are. And we want to continue to provide good content and value every time we come live. So with that being said, we can pull up the rest of the panel. Who we have with us tonight? Woo, look at that. We got my beautiful co-host, Will Stevenson. How's it going, brother? Aloha, amigo. I am chilling over in, I'm, in te I'm technically in Indiana right now. So because we're on the border in Indiana, Illinois is like the... Uh, the East Coast, West Coast time zone, it's technically eight o'clock for me. And like, as soon as I drive back the other way to go back to uh, the, the city that I'm working in, it's going to be seven o'clock. So I'm, uh, I'm pretty, I'm, I'm having a good time, like crossing between the um, crossing between the timelines and shit every single day and getting <laughs> confused as to when things are happening and stuff. But life is good, man. Um, did some did some cool work up on the tower today. Like I like I haven't I don't know if I've told you guys before, but this is like my first time being back on a tower since like late October. And so I'm just stoked as hell to be climbing again and being up in the air and no longer being like a filthy little ground pounder and chilling out on the dirt all the time. So I gotta hang out in the harness and go do fun things. And I've been listening to this book all day long today. And bro, it's been it's been kick ass. I'm stoked to get this thing kicked off. Sam, bro, how are you? What's going on, man? Oh man, I'm glad you asked. I am fired up and ready to talk about this book as well. It was just like reading this thing was just like bomb after bomb, and I'm just I'm stoked to talk about it. Life's good. I got some good projects coming up, but the most important one actually that I would just want to drop a nugget here is 
the Brothers Two of Them cookbook that has been worked on for so long is done. We are accepting pre-orders, so go ahead and DM Will or I. You know, you probably know where to find us on Telegram or whatnot. <laughs> and uh, we'll do a throw. We're doing thirty dollars pre-orders, and uh, we'll just basically give you back whatever's left over at the end. We're not trying to make money. We're just trying to get these beautiful cookbooks. So we're only printing a hundred. So uh, let us know, and we'll make you. We'll put you on the list. Beautiful. Love to hear it. I, I'm sure we'll probably have some people uh, asking you to sign those in person when we do our, our meetup event this year. We do have some interesting news when it comes to all the Richard Hart stuff because the October 24th date in Brooklyn, New York is looking like it's going to happen. So there's a distinct possibility that some of us might be out there for that. Or we'll be in Miami for the Cardano conference. We're trying to figure that one out ourselves. Other than that, we have our final member of the panel and guy I already shouted out, Farmer Jay. What's going on, brother? What is this? Hey, what's, going? what's going on? Can you guys hear me? Yes, sir. Uh, I'm going to want that pre-order copy. Can I pay an incentive token? Sure. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> you can pay however you want, bro. This is um, kick-ass. Yeah, I've been listening. I listened to the book today at work. I listened to it yesterday, but it's kind of noisy where I was at. So, but, but I did listen to it twice. So hopefully I can add to the conversation. Hell yeah, bro. Good Perfect. stuff. Speaking of which, I am going to make a bit of a magical transition myself. But in the meantime, my beautiful panel, can you guys give us a, a quick tidbit of what may be a favorite part of the book or a good quote that you have is? And then I will yes. see you in the producer's chair. I'm going to I'm going to start start this whole thing off. And I just gotta say, like, I freaking love this book. This chick is oh, I'm the I'm the temporary. Oh man, we're zoomed in on me. Um my this this whole book was just my absolute favorite, and I super duper loved it. And uh the the thing that I like the most, and so I'm gonna, I'm gonna split it between two things. One is that life is poker, not chess, which is like I've never much liked chess, and I do like poker. So it, like that, like when I heard her say that, I was like, oh, I got this immediate little like, hooray! My my thesis has been at least not maybe not proven, but like somebody else agrees with it. Um, and then the second thing was the the distinction between the reflective mind and the decisive mind, or no, deliberate mind. Um. It was, it was either reflective and reflective and decisive or reflective and deliberate. But the point is like, you've got two different, two different ways to think about things. And one is that you, you, you mull over decisions for a long period of time. And the other one is like, you react to it immediately and you make the next decision. And I think that that's a, that's a really cool thing for folks to think about is like the difference between the reflexive mind and the decisive mind, because most often people are, are they're using the wrong one for each task. And so if you can optimize whether you're making reflexive decisions or whether you're making deliberate decisions, um, then that will help you out greatly in your life. So that was that was my favorite part of the book. Uh, Mr. Mr. Sam, what was your favorite favorite part of the book or a couple of little quotes that you liked there? I'd, I'd have to say that my, oh, excuse me, my favorite part of this book was just the, the concept of breaking down the, the like, people not believing well people believing too much in what they believe to the point that they won't even question their beliefs uh that was something that's very important to me is the is, is being willing to hear anyone talk about anything and have a rational conversation about it and discuss points of view and always having the feedback loop open so that you're taking in new information and like not all information is good but you got to at least process it and be like, well, that either aligns with everything that makes sense or it doesn't. And, you know, maybe, the, maybe you take one piece of it or not. But like my favorite part of this book was just that, that concept of everyone's just guessing. Like we don't, none of us know what the perfect reality is. And so we're all just <laughs> placing our bets on what makes sense to us with the given information and the systems that we understand. And so the world's going to keep throwing like, this this uh what, what was the word chaotic data the world just throws this chaotic data at you and you have to find a way to sh like pick out the the filter out the noise and feel like what is what is the the you know this I ideal reality or not ideal but like what is the true reality that we live in and and how can we best like live in it and so that was just that was really awesome to me so i mean i'm i'm stoked to get talking about this so I'll pass it on to uh mr farmer j over here well, kind of like the same thing that Will and Sam thought that, you know, it's it, it's it's kind of randomness. You can plan whatever you want, but at the end of the day, like you said, it's not chess. It's like poker. You can 
plan and you can look at numbers, but you have to be ready for the unexpected that gets thrown your way. We don't always know what's coming. Even if, if we believe that our numbers are right or whatever, we're, we're, we still have to understand that not everything is going to go according to plan. Beautiful. Excellent. All right. Is this the right time? How'd I do? Are you back? I'm back, baby. Excellent. Uh, what was your so, favorite part of the book, Zenith? Uh, Throw a question right back at you. <laughs> well done, sir. Well done. Uh, one of my favorite parts of the book was it was the idea of actually talking about uh, thinking about decisions in bets. Because a lot of the stuff that I've done, I like, fair warning to everybody out there i'm a big probability and statistics nerd so when it comes to like probability and risk uh weighted decision making this is something i've studied pretty good and i've also done a lot of this in my professional career when it comes to risk management so extending it that extra step not just from like monetary decisions or like financial damage in, in case of like a catastrophic event or something but the idea that pretty much every decision is a bet of some kind is it's an interesting concept to think about and we're gonna that's one of the questions that i have laid out is that i want to ask the panel about is it is it useful to think about literally every decision as a bet because it's this thing where it's like you can absolutely put confidence curves and like probabilities behind different outcomes based on stuff however at the same time there's a bottom line usefulness that you kind of got to get out of everything you do. So if the things that you're doing are not useful, then it's not really a point in doing them other than for like academic exercise. So that's what I was, one of the things I was thinking about, which is that I really like the idea of thinking about every decision you make as a bet, whether it's like a bet against like your future selves, or if it's just straight poker, which I also love playing as well. So, <laughs> uh, yeah, that's what my favorite part is. Do we have any last minute things before I get to the chapter summary rundown? I'm seeing a lot of silence. All right, I'm that good. means it's time to do a quick summary of the book for everybody at home. I'm going to check the comments real quick just to make sure we haven't missed anybody. Oh, shoot, we got a few folks. We got uh, Mr. Angry Twinkie. He says, oh, hope everyone is having a most excellent Friday. Hope you are having a most excellent Friday as well. And by the way, Twinkie, we th thanks for... Uh, all, all the friendship and all the effort and all the collaboration is this has been an absolute blast and we are super stoked that you're part of the part of the part of the group and the culture and you have your own channel going that is honestly killing it right now the stream that you and uh boogie did with almighty hexagon now or i guess the artist formerly known as almighty hexagon now just almighty that was a great stream really enjoyed uh seeing him on there and then we also had a great chat with him as well uh lastly one more person snuck in here we got paul Sachs. he says hola peoples a lot of Mr. Paul Sachs. What's going on, brother? Aloha. Uh, beautiful. Alrighty, it is time to talk about some chapter summaries. So, thankfully, this book only has six chapters in it. However, they go pretty quickly, and the ideas are kind of self-contained, but two or three of them kind of blend in together. So, the first off is one of the ideas that Farmer Jay was talking about, which is that life is poker, not chess. The idea here is that chess theoretically has a correct or statistically correct move to make. You can go look up all the different chess engines that exist out there. They can literally tell you 15, 16, 17, 18 turns down the road. What are all the different possible combinations and permutations of the moves that happen and where you sit as a result at the end of it. Poker, on the other hand, is based a lot on probabilities because there's unknown information. This first chapter wants you to get comfortable with the idea of uncertainty and the fact that you will not have all the knowledge all the time, and that's okay. We're going to learn how to make the best moves we can with the knowledge that we do have available. Alrighty, chapter two is want to bet. It is the idea that decisions are bets of various kinds. Think of bets as expressing confidence levels. It's that idea that if you ask somebody, hey, you want to bet on that after they make like some kind of wild claim, it's the idea of like, hey, how much conviction do you have behind this thing? And can you like mathematically pinpoint exactly the, the confidence level that you have in it? Alrighty, chapter three, we have bet to learn. This is the idea that changing our mindset to feel rewarded when we acknowledge contributions of others and luck. It's, it's the cycle of learning and getting feedback to understand where you made good plays and good decision making. And then what was kind of the stuff beyond your control or the things that the other people did to contribute to that success, skill, failure, whatever. 
After that, it's uh, the idea of learning from all your bets, which is that you got to be able to admit your mistakes, identify errors, even in successful outcomes, which is that even when you win, understand if there are ways you could have played better. And then lastly is follow good decision-making processes, which is that I forgot to cover it in the first one, but one of the basic foundational ideas is the idea of resulting, AKA results-based justification for your decision-making. It's very easy to look at things after they have come to fruition and decide like very black and white, be like, oh, that was a wrong decision because you got it wrong. As opposed to, no, 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 the thinking and the process before that critical point that was correct it's just that we got the improbable outcome therefore it's unfortunate this time next up we got the buddy system aka the truth seeking pods if you caught the think and grow rich episode this is going to be very familiar to you but it also gets very deep on the topic and i think adds a, a layer of complexity to it that really adds to the idea so this is the idea of getting people together for a very specific objective that you can scrutinize your process and your mindset and how you arrive at your conclusions and decisions. And then you have people that you trust that are all here for the common goal of trying to dissect this and improve it. It's not about just a social club or just chit chatting or moaning about your bad beats. It's actually, it's people focused and dedicated and are able to put that ego aside and look at the process and try to reform it. So next up, we have Descent to Win. This is a part two of the first chapter talking about the truth-seeking pods. This is one of the chapters that talks about how dissenting information or information that is contrary to what you already believe or your narrative or your decision-making process is some of the most important information that you can take in, but it's also the hardest to take in because A, if you're unable to check the ego at the door, that means that this is going to be hard to absorb and anything that confirms you're already ex very large bias is going to be a lot easier to take in. So this is the idea that dissenting or having someone on your team play the, ba the bad guy or be the dissenter and kind of throw those opposing viewpoints, it allows you to check the process and make sure you don't have any blind spots or that you've overlooked anything or that you're too far into your own bias to like really see what's going on. This is a great one. And this chapter also talks a little bit about the idea of Having a higher IQ doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to have an easier time making decisions. If anything, you have a lot more reasoning capability to rationalize a bad decision just because you're rationalizing your position to yourself over and over and effectively doubling down on the things you already believe. Next up, we are at chapter six, the last one. This is a good one, in my opinion, because it talks about adventures in mental time travel. This is where you're not just changing your mindset on decision making from looking at black and white, right, wrong to probabilities, but now you're applying it over a time scale, understanding how these decisions look in the grand scheme stacked up next to each other over whether it's uh, what they call the 10, 10, 10 rule, whether it's 10 minutes, 10 months, 10 years. It's the idea of being able to look at something like, I don't know, a, a crypto chart and understand where you are on the chart and not just staring at the 15 minute chart and having uh, very emotional reactions to the very tiny candles on the grand scheme of, scheme of things. Uh, this is where we're gonna talk about Berkshire Hathaway. The author actually pro provides a pretty good PDF document along with the audiobook that I'm sure a lot of us listen to, but it talks about some of the, uh, the thinking loop processes. And then also it gives a two part diagram about Berkshire Hathaway's stock price, which is here's how it looks over 10 years compared to the S&P 500, fun fact, they killed it. And then they give you any single day broke, broken down by basically the minute by minute chart. And on that one, it even shows like, this can get hairy at points, but when you zoom out, the larger picture starts to form and that's when you can really make those good long-term decision plays. Whew. Alrighty, that what is what I got for, <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> I was jumping around in the backyard, running up here and trying to, spew all that out but glad you're great already much appreciated much appreciated first topic i want to talk to you boys about it's the one that farmer jay brought up previously which is that life is poker not chess so i want to ask you gentlemen in in what aspects of your life do you think that you've already been doing this or you want to think about this more it's the idea that you're not making mathematical correct decisions but it's the idea that you don't have all the information so you, you accept that you're kind of going blind in on some of the things, but you can pretty, you, you can make a decent guess at what you think the probability of outcomes is going to be. So what are some areas of life that you think we can apply this to? 
man, I don't want to, I don't want to just kind of like ruin the whole thing, but I'm going to say everything, you know, it's, it, it's, it's all, it's all that stuff. I'm sure that there's some, there's some things that are more than others, but like the, the thing that I know the most is that I know pretty much nothing about most everything. And so like the amount of variables and the amount of uncontrolled things, like irrespective of how much like subject matter expertise I have, like there's a lot of stuff that we don't know about. So that's my, that's my blanket, un, uncomplicated, not very nuanced answer. Um, <laughs> not really, not really good at answering your question. I'm going to go ahead and pass it off on to either Sam or farmer Jay. Uh, well, well, I would say the or, same thing. Jay, yeah. The, the more you learn stuff, the more you realize you don't know shit. Yeah. Like the more you study a subject, you realize how little you know about the subject and how yep. wide you can expand on it. And it's just, yeah, I you're agree. Entirely Zenith. Right. I think the it's the idea of I think all too often we believe that we know all the information, but there's a million ways to skin a cat, and like that's the same with thing with life, which is that you might think that you have everything narrowed down to all the different variables, but there's so many different extraneous factors that could factor. But granted, it might be like microscopic percentages. However, at the same time. You don't have all the information. Like I really like the example that the author gave in the book of the scene from the Princess Bride, where they do the the test of wits about the uh, the eye of game powder and the two glasses of wine, and the the answer was it was pretty much that the test boils down to a bite what the what the guy taking the test thought was the binary solution. It's either this cup or that cup that has the poison in it. It's only one of those two options. Therefore, that is all of the information. Am I cutting out? Yeah, you're cutting out quite a bit. Uh, I don't know if it was just on my end or something, but we're getting up like let's try eighty percent of every. That's better. That's way better. <laughs> okay, I don't know why, but I have to like reset it periodically. Anyways, the idea of not having all the information, Princess Bride, Test of Wits. It's thinking that the poison is either in one of the two cups. It's binary. There's no other outside information. Ultimately, the guy lost because the protagonist had outside information which was that he knew that he had been building up resistance to the poison for the last few years so if he drinks the poison he'll be fine which means that he created a third option which was that the poison was in both of the cups aka became a no-win scenario for the uh for the bad guy i forget the the actor's name he's really good crap oh the sicilian i don't don't know man anyways uh he he does the voice of the dinosaur in toy story for those that's the that's the only other way that i know him <laughs> is he's the dinosaur shoot i'm gonna hop off of that while he's thinking of the dinosaur name and say that like the that that whole premise of like n- the unrealized like other potential solutions and like how that kind of parallels to the thinking of like convergent thinking versus divergent thinking right it's the concept of understanding that you don't have all the answers and that there's a huge range of like potential like solutions and answers that could solve the problem in a bunch of different ways and like the best example i could think of especially cuz you're you're talking about the cups thing is like you know i mean everybody's everybody knows about the video of like you know two girls in one cup but no one knows about what happened with the second cup you know <laughs> what what a what an, what an image Boom. one of them was thirsty one cup never got drank from what a what a pity that was zenith i've uh, i've sent you a um um a visual a visual thing on telegram if you wouldn't mind finding a way to share your screen and pulling that up it's called the dunning kruger effect yes For those sir. of you okay, who you want dunning kruger yes Yes, yes. So this is called the Dunning-Kruger effect, and it basically describes what we're talking about in in a little bit different, uh, in a little bit different terms. So, for those of you guys who who have never seen the Dunning-Kruger, it's essentially just a chart that that compares a person's like perceived confidence on on like the uh, on the x-axis versus their actual knowledge and experience and ability on the Y axis, right? So yeah, so here it is. So confidence over knowledge. And then this is also like, it, it's implied that the, the, the knowledge line is also time. So in the beginning, you've got the little guy who knows nothing and he is not confident and he's like, huh, what the heck is this? And then so like, we've all like hopped into a hobby before, hopped into a video game or hopped into like a, a, a place of work where it's like, in the very beginning, we 
we like start doing a thing and it's like, oh shit, I'm learning this real quick. Like I must know everything about it. And then you get to the, I know it all point. The pe- it's called the peak of Mount Stupid, right? And then, uh, <laughs> and then, and then after you get to the peak of Mount Stupid, there's generally like an eating slice, hum- slice of humble pie point, which is like, oh no, there's more than I realized. It's like, I don't know anything. Ah, and you know, Valley of, and that's called the Valley of Despair. And then uh, generally as you progress through time, if you, a lot of people quit when they get to the value of the, the Valley of Despair, they quit once they, they, uh, and this is something that, <clears throat> excuse me, Alex Hormozzi talks about too, is a, a very similar graph about like S curve. Um, but it's super similar to this. But anyways, uh, you get into the Valley of Despair and then you generally like start learning by either, you know, getting mentors or just like making a shit ton of mistakes to the point where like you have no choice but to learn or die. I guess, you know, whenever, like taking, taking things to either of the two extremes. Right. Uh, and then after a while, the, the longer you stick with something, the better you get. And then it's like, oh, okay, it's starting to make sense. And then like, we learn we learned that it's complicated that we don't know everything and that we've gotten, that's why we've got like reference manuals and we've got Google and we've got mentors and we've got like subject matter experts. And we've got, you know, like grandpa who's been doing this for 50 years. Right. And then eventually you get your 10,000 hours up and you become like a, a person who's, who's really good at stuff. But this is uh, for those of you guys, who, who have never seen this before. This is a fantastic chart to show to someone uh, at, at any stage of their, um, of their like, like whether they're at the peak of Mount Stupid or they're in the Valley of Despair or they're at the It's Complicated uh, stage. Like anyone, anyone will, will recognize this chart and be able to be like, oh shit, this applies to me and this, that, the other thing. And this is, this is the thing that I thought of uh, when they were, when they were talking about this, uh, this sort of concept in the book and things. Definitely. I think this is slightly, I think it's pretty closely related, but it's a different study, but it's the idea of when you acquire skills or you're learning to do new sports or activities and stuff, there's kind of four phases that you go through. The first one is that you are bad and you are so bad that you don't understand how bad you are. And then there's phase two, which is that you start to realize, okay, I understand how bad I am, but I'm still bad. Step three is starting to figure it out, starting to get some skills. And then step four is mastery, where you actually have skills and knowledge to understand where you are in relation to everyone else in the sport and your mastery of it. It's it's the idea of understanding where you fit on that curve or that continuum. And when it comes to bias, which we're talking about the Dunning-Kruger effect, the bias is something that we it, you have to try to like force it out of you all the time with everything you do, which is do I actually know what I'm doing or am I just getting lucky and then writing it off as competence or skill? So when it comes to probabilities, you're not going to be able to accurately assign probability based on or your confidence level until you actually understand where you fall on this continuum of what your actual knowledge and level is. So uh, overcoming bias is a point for another one, but at the same time, you can't really even start to to apply this stuff unless you have a certain level of understanding and overcoming bias or overcoming overcoming that just like skill gap or the the valley of despair you got to have the knowledge to understand and actually make those predictive plays make sense yep yes i I like that uh that the that four stages that's a good one i'm gonna have to remember that is a good one so Back to the notes. So we were talking about understanding that life is poker and not chess. I think that this, so I want to ask the question of what is more useful? Is it, it's kind of like one of those things through evolutionary psychology, or if you look back at evolution over time, which is that the things that survive and adapt aren't necessarily morally correct or like intellectually correct. But whatever they're doing has real world practical implications. What I mean by that is that it's sometimes simpler to get that 80% solution to get you the rest of the way instead of come up with the masterwork, the thesis, the, the doctorate degree for the answer of whatever you're trying to come up with, which is you get the thing that works and because it works, it gets passed on. Is this, I look at this way of thinking when it comes to the probabilities and decision making as this is very antithetical to what humans have done over a long period of time so what's the use case for this being more practical in today's day and age than just using black and white statements of right and wrong and using results-based orientation for justifying your decisions can you restate that question condensed because that like i well, i was no people I, in the black yeah like <laughs> i, I sort question. of I, I mean if anyone else <laughs> I I need to like hear that a little bit 
more succinctly, if you don't mind. All right. Your ancestors went unga bunga, and they looked yeah. at the berries, and they said, I'm either going to eat these berries and not eat these berries. Some of them ate the berries and died. Some of them ate the berries and lived. So, therefore, they weren't thinking in probabilities of what are what are the odds that these berries kill me? Should okay. I make my decision based on that? And the answer is no. They just kind of did. And then what ends up happening is that the people that found the practical or the useful answer, those are the ones that ended up procreating. So yeah. now we have a system over a long period of time where you're rewarded not for thinking in probabilities, but in just doing what is deemed the correct action as based on results. So now that we've we've kind of evolved a little bit, I would argue, and we're at the point where you can make decisions that aren't going to kill you, but can actually benefit you. So now we're at this point where thinking in probabilities actually becomes practical and useful as opposed to just thinking black and white. Because if it's black and white, I mean, when it comes to the whole Bitcoin question, the answer is just buy, don't sell, right? But as anybody in the crypto space can tell you, is that there's got to, well, unless you're Michael Saylor, there has to be a profit-taking strategy to help cultivate this or understand where your finish line is at. So what other, where in life does it seem that probabilities is actually useful for us now? I'm going to hop right in here. So it, it sounds like you're, the, if I understand correctly, the difference in our modern society where we no longer have the like weight of death imminently floating all of, over all of our heads and like starvation and hunger and like that's all pretty much been solved, right? So now we're all free to specialize in trades and like play the markets with extra money. We have extra food, like there's all this extra stuff. And so it becomes like, it's gotten to the point where now like it's not just tribes competing to stay alive. It's tribes competing to like have wealth and more wealth than the other tribe. And if we're going to be playing games of who can do extra good better than the other guy trying to do extra good, then that's going to take a lot of nuance and it's going to take a lot of this extra level of thinking, which is a revolving around statistics and probabilities. And I would like, I would say it's like, it's a necessity because if like, for those that haven't taken the statistics class, it's like, probability is something that literally like the, the math governs everything. I mean, if there's, if there's a 60% probability that I win on a trade and like, that's just like what the math is, then if I just do an infinite number of trades, I'm going to keep winning. And so it's like the, like the importance of knowing about like statistics and how it can like affect things is, is, is very important. And so for those people that need that extra edge, like, cause we're all, we're all surviving, you know, we're all feeding our, feeding our, our families and ourselves and, and, and whatever, like we have all generally speaking, have a place that we live. Some of us live in connexes, some of us live in not connexes, right? But we've all got a place. And so, you know, like getting those little tiny extra edges above people is literally just like, you have to fine tune those probabilities. And like she was saying in the book, like, it's not that you're going to like win, like you're not going to be able to take advantage of 90% of the like decision, like the learning opportunities in poker. But if you can take advantage of 10% of it and the other guy is only taking advantage of nine, then you're going to get that edge. And like over time you will be performing better, you know? So for sure. That's so all. That's all the reason I brought that. up the whole evolutionary concept with this is it's not supposed to be a red herring. I want to illustrate the fact that, for a large part of human history, we've used the results-based justification for a lot of things. And it's kind of been bred into us because that's how people just survived. It is, it's, it's pretty binary. It's like, did you either pass on your genes or did you not? So this book, I think, challenges like typical mentality, which is why I want to ask the question of how, like, how hard is it going to be to try to break out of these like old ways of thinking and try to go to something more cutting edge like this? And to your point, Sam, you're entirely right, which is that we're no longer fighting for survival, but now we have excess of things 
and you through that excess we're no longer trying to like fight to the death but we're trying to get ahead and compete with each other in more sophisticated ways and this seems like an evolution of that which is that you're no longer just kind of like shotgun blasting out like lottery tickets and then finding the winner it's more of understanding that you're going to have wins you're going to have losses as long as you can make sure the wins overcome the losses then this is practical and useful because over time that's going to be where you stack those small wins and it's going to add up to that giant heap eventually sense all right fair uh, enough it, i mean it makes sense i'm not sure what like i'm supposed to jump off of that what was your what was your original question just like where is this more useful yeah which like, the, the one line versus the other yeah, where in life okay. can we apply probabilities as opposed to 100%, 0%? Like, this is the right choice, this is the wrong choice. As opposed, mm. like, like where can you use the probability stuff? I mean, just for an example, there's an entire profession that pretty much is just this, and it's called being an actuary, which is understanding what is the probability of somebody dying, how much is their life worth, or the payout that we're going to have to pay in life insurance, and then how does that factor into a certain amount of estimated value or cost that we're going to have to pay them and then also charge them to a, maintain the company and have benefits available? It's, like, it's interesting. It's like a it's it's like a liquidity pairing, you know. It's like a person's a person's life against the money that the insurance like charges, and then like the probability of it going up and the company being in green candles, or the probability of it going down. People die more often than they than they guess. What an interesting concept, uh, man. I'm kind of I'm, I'm stuck on that a little bit. But uh, the thing that I wanted to to say is that you can you can make your life more or less efficient depending on how much you want to rely on probability and how much focus you want to put into um, like. The the it, per, perhaps my interpretation is wrong here, but I'm seeing this as kind of like a you can make the uh, the reactive or the what was it like the, the 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 quick black and white decisions right, or you can make the more like nuanced um, uh, well thought through decisions. Kind of does does this is am I crazy here? Does this kind of sort of tie back to the like the reflexive mind versus the deliberate mind? Is that is this? Am I, am I the only one drawing these conclusions? No, you can absolutely draw that one as well. I don't think I covered that in this in the summary, but one of the things that Andy talks about is the reflexive mind versus the the definitive mind or the deliberative okay. mind, which is yeah. it's it's short twitch and fast twitch. It's are you yeah. doing things on instinct and gut feeling as like self preservation, or are you actually really using that frontal cortex and like mulling over decisions and like trying to use logic and reason to overcome things as opposed to just doing what is built into you. Yeah, and and that was that was honestly my favorite part of the book was the the reflexive versus the the deliberate like mind split part, and like people people who make who don't make enough decisions they and they want to make more decisions to be more effective then they can they can choose to go more for the like the the reflexive deciding uh, line of thinking and then the people who are making too many like shitty decisions they might benefit from from slowing down and being more deliberate. You know, so it's like depending on where you're at on the spectrum would would depend on what kind of like advice or, or actionable steps or like potential tools a person could use. Uh, one would one would then like give them in return. So these these things are these these notions, these ideas are tools that people can put in their tool belts. They need to be able to determine where am I on this like spectrum and what is the best tool for me to accomplish my goal. Those are those are my condensed thoughts on on the uh uh the the general topic that we're talking about fair enough let's pass it over to the other guys what do you think about the the reflexive versus deliberate deliberate deliberative portions of your mind the the thinking versus reacting any meeny miny mo go go ahead go jay. farmer jay no he's talking to you sam <laughs> well if he's talking to me then i guess i'll i'll, I'll answer so I mean, to me, the the reflective versus the passive, uh, so the reflexive versus versus the active or whatever the words were, deliberate, uh, deliberate, deliberate, yes, and reflexive. Okay, so those to me 
Like there's a parallel between that and like the rational versus the emotional or the yeah. hot. I like, I like to think of it as cold system, hot system. I don't yep. remember what book I read when I, when I heard that, but I'll hopefully it ends up on our book list at some point. But you know, it was once explained to me that your, you know, your, your brain thinks in two different systems, just like this, the hot system is the like, Oh, like I'm, I am alert. I'm alive. I'm trying to like make decisions that are going to like actively fix a problem. And there's a lot of high emotion. There's a lot of chemicals flowing through your bloodstream. And it's a, it, you know, it's, that's one way of operating. And then there's the cold system thinking, which is slow, calm. You're sitting down or you are laying down and you are thinking about like long term and you're rationalized or you're, you're thinking rationally about things and you're analyzing and you're able to even you may still feel emotions, but you're able to see your emotions and you're able to see yourself feeling them and you can separate yourself from them. And so uh, a, a very like easy example of correlating this is if you are like, you know, literally like getting hot and steamy in a shower with your girlfriend or wife because you know you know father son holy spirit right so it's your wife and um if you turn the cold water on all of a sudden she's gonna have a very different line of thought and so it's just like you know they're like those are the two operating modes that we can flip back and forth between and that's just like a parallel uh my of my understanding of that you know, reflexive versus deliberate. I like the cold water. Good analogy. For, Farmer Jay, when people are trying to take over your corner under the 405, do you have to like think about how you're going to dismantle them or you just kind of go just take them out? Grab the two by four with the barbed wire. Bah. Go to the problem solver, if you will. <laughs> Fair enough. I like Already. It. I want to. I want to do a quick time for some community shout outs. We have a lot of people trickle in and we are thrilled to have you all here. It seems like this is a pretty, pretty good topic. And I'm glad we picked this book. By the way, massive shout out to Walrus. He was the one that recommended this book for us for book club. And I'm very glad that he did. This was a good read. I think it's about like just under seven hours at one time speed on audible. So it's not too bad. But at the same time, if you can do double speed, I'd recommend it. And honestly, the information is not so dense that you have to like really like go back and do a lot of the things over again. You can kind of understand the concepts. And if you've been following up with the books that we've been doing here, this is probably some decently familiar territory. So first up, we got the bribe man himself. Woo, Mr. Fast Abdul. Final advice, use bribes to change the odds. I think that is possible, actually. Using the bribes to change the odds is possible because if you can create the incentive for people to do the good behavior you want them to do anyways, you're only increasing the chances that they're going to do it. I like that a lot. That's actually really good. Next yep. up, we got Hexagon Lost in Asia. Says, anyone else got that chop? I think he might have been referring to me, but at the same time, glad to have you here. Uh, the chop that you usually come here for is the, uh, the strip club music in the beginning, but you missed out on it, brother. What are you doing? Next up, we got Alan Fizame. Yeah, did Sam evolve into Agent Smith? Yes. I think we're in the, the second Matrix movie territory right now where he's taking over everybody. All righty, up next, we got Frank White. ski -yay! Indeed. Thanks for showing up, brother. Really appreciate it. Oh, we got a uh, fan favorite and longtime friend of ours, Moon Pill Rational Optics. How you doing, my man? He says, what's up, DGENs? We're just DGENing over here and doing weird things in the backyard and scaring the neighbors. You know, nothing too crazy. <laughs> All righty. And we got Benny Blanco. He says, I started playing poker in 2003 and went pro in 2004 playing online. This is his wheelhouse. Awesome to hear it, buddy. If I remember correctly, that's kind of like the golden age of online poker. I think that was uh, when uh, Chris Moneymaker made the his crazy run doing the... Uh, doing the crazy world series of poker winning the the narrative was he was just an average dude that played a little online poker and got decent and then just had a crazy run at the tournament in las vegas and ended up winning it and made like life-changing money this is really the era that uh propelled it to start doing all like the espn coverage and getting mainstream and that's what really exploded it and then the online poker obviously took off i was gonna say if you don't mind i'd like to jump in here since we're on the on the benny blanco he later commented in poker you want to make the best long-term decision each time it's your decision to act if you can make the correct long-term decision more often than not you're a winning player it's that simple thank you mrs producer for uh hopping on the fly and apologies for interrupting here but this is so like on topic <laughs> to what you were saying 
Zenith that like, I didn't want to let this, let this, uh, get passed by. So definitely ab- like, I'm not, I'm not a professional poker player, Benny, by, by any stretch of the imagination, but like what you're saying sounds very correct with what my experience has been. And you can probably extrapolate that same, that same line of reasoning to most things in life. If you make the correct long-term decision, then most often you'll be, you'll be doing well. And that's like, again, that's broad. That's, that's like broad advice. There's, there's anomalies and there's, there's most nuance and there's, yeah, exactly. Exactly. There's, there's, uh, there's definitely nuances and, and what if scenarios for everyone. Yeah, I think she, she even goes in in the book about uh, that one time when there was like an 18% chance of somebody winning when she was yep. dealing, uh, she laid out the percentages and the person actually won that had the 18%. And it's yep. like, sometimes just stuff. You, that's just the way it goes. Like you have probable, that's what's probably going to happen, but it's not a guarantee. Exactly. It's never a guarantee. Remember, Jay, that's a really good example from the book because that was when she was teaching people about this like mind shit, my, uh, mindset change. And <laughs> she was like, this hand is an 18% chance of winning. And then it ended up winning. And then some guy from the crowd was like, I think you're wrong. He won. He wasn't supposed to. And she goes, nope, I'm correct because he's just improbable at winning. And you witnessed that one out of five time. And then later on, she talks about how the guy like actually like started to understand it. He goes, oh, that's the 18% that we just saw. That's kind of rare, but cool that it happened. So, I wanted to make a quick response to Fast Abdul actually in his comment when he said, final advice, use bribes to change the odds. Uh, I just finished reading uh, Start With Why by Simon Sinek. And in that book, he's describing the difference. And in, in this, is, this is relevant, I think to if you if you are trying to use transactions and bribes to grow your, your you know market to people and grow your audience to change the odds i would argue that you're going to have a better success changing the odds if you like follow some of the concepts in the start with why book which is like having a a why and a purpose and a vision that people will identify with so that basically instead as you know this is two ways to grow a company right they can both work but I would say that if you speak to a person's like emotional side and their roots and like they can identify with what, what you're after, you are probably going to have a better long-term effect than if you are making transactions and they're like rationalizing it in the moment because you're making a deal. As soon as you, as soon as your money dries up to make those deals, they don't, they have no reason to care about your company. That's just a small side thought. Interesting thought for sure. I think one of the yes. topics that the author touches on briefly in this book is what is game theory. I think I yeah, yep, they did. Game game theory is the economic or mathematical analysis of rational actors making decisions around each other, and I like yeah, you're absolutely right. Which is that when when you use the finance side of things, you can only get so far. But when you actually start to appeal to other bits of the brain and that like subconscious, you can really get that extra mile. So big, I want to give a quick, a quick shout out to my good friend, Crypto Kool-Aid. He is a, uh, a game developer and a, and a game theory enthusiast is the wrong word. He corrects me every time I use the frame, the phrase game theory. He talks about system theory and everything, but the, the, he, he has described a lot of the concepts in this book, just like phenomenally to a point. Um, he doesn't like the phrase game theory, but like, <laughs> you good, bro? <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, he, he has he has described a lot of like this game theory game. Th- forgive me, Larry, if you're listening. Uh, he has described a lot of the, the game theory <laughs> stuff like in in super duper crazy detail. So if you guys ever have the chance to go look him up on Twitter, his uh, his handle is Crypto Kool Aid uh, spelled with K's, and he is he is a like a, a crazy smart dev, and he's working with uh, with Gifford and Kinetics on the whole the whole Pulsar ecosystem thing. It's not quite live yet, but like. They're they're very interested in game. Forgive me again for using the wrong word. Game theory, systems theory, basically the way that people interact with each other inside of like set set rules and like and uh, set scenarios like in chess, and also like the the not set rules and the unpredictable world of poker and everything. So a big shout out to shout out to Larry. I wanted to say that I was I was. Uh, like I had, I had a lot of the things that he had taught me flashing through my mind while I was reading this. And you guys would do very well to hop inside the telegrams that he runs and also go check out his Twitter. Super smart guy. Talks about this stuff all the time. Another telegram? 
yeah and so he's also mm-hmm. he's also inside of the dj roundtable telegram like community telegram so you guys can reach out to him in there um or you can call him on call him on the phone like an adult which is his his favorite thing if you guys have his phone number then that's his preferred means of contact but for everyone else like hit him up and hit him up in the dj roundtable uh telegram community he's in there often he's in the pulsar telegram he's in uh gifford's telegram for the all the all of gifford's projects and everything so big big player in the in the hex ecosystem and very smart gentleman he will he will send you all sorts of great information on uh Again, not game theory, but what like systems theory, I believe, is what he calls it. But yeah, fantastic. Big shout out. Sorry for detracting. Let's uh, get back on topic. That was not a detraction. That was an addition. Thank you very much. Alrighty, we got two more chats I want to cover. The first one was from our own Nate. Let me get it. He is feeling a little bit under the weather. We hope you feel much better, my man. Hope you guys are doing well. Same thing with Mrs. Producer. Sorry to hear you. The uh, all the stuff was uh running through the house we're looking forward to having you guys back to chat with us about all these good books nate says just made it back in saw the intro congrats z you created the greatest celebration in youtube history hint it was pre-recorded yep definitely pre-recorded uh-huh. <laughs> sure <laughs> much appreciated man get better soon that was great i love how you uh... change shirts too you went from Hawaiian oh. back to the back to the the Z long sleeve. Is that is that my look? I always wear the the Ron John long sleeves, and then you're I the think, bad idea t shirt guy. Yeah, I think so. I could be wrong, but I'm pretty That's sure true. you always wear the Ron John Ron. I almost said Ron John long johns, but it rolls off. I the just lo- easy. I just love these. This is my personal favorite shirt. We'll get into it another time. But yes, they're good shirts. Uh, last but not least, we got Kai saying that one of us had a good line. I can't remember who it was, but one of us did. If anything, we'll just attribute it to Benny Blanco because his chat before that, he was saying that it was the golden age indeed. Such great memories. I hope we have a poker boom 2.0 again someday. You and me both, brother. I know that a uh, real world assistant or AKA using a calculator or a solver to make plays online is become a, a big hot topic issue, especially as computing power has gotten more and more prevalent were an increased overall. So it's effectively easier. I mean, it is technically cheating because you're not using your own brain. You're using a computer brain to make decisions. But at the same time, things can be exploited theoretically, but until they get that solved, online poker is having a bit of a bit of a dip. All is fair in love and war, ladies and gentlemen. If you're not taking steroids while playing sports, or if you're not uh, juicing to go do the tour de France, someone else is. And you're going to lose if you're competing everything like like all of life is a competition and this is another thing she talks about in the book too now whether like you choose to like go the pure way or the or the or like the uh or the 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 fast track way is how i'll phrase that it's totally up to you and like no judgment from me that like other people might judge you but like the way i figured is everyone is free to do whatever they need to do farmer jay you look like you got something i read somewhere that life is a competition and money is the way of keeping score that's one exactly. Way to look at it. Yep. I I would say that there's 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 a man there's a ton of ways to to keep score, but money's like the one that allows you to do things. You know, yeah, like uh, a civilization, money is the way. It used to be other yep. ways, but we live in a yep. civilized society now, where like you said, money allows you to do things. It, yep. It, it, it basically buys you freedom. Mm-hmm. Power, it's... authority, sovereignty. One of the other analogies I've heard is that you can kind of think in like 21st century terms, like money is the manifestation of value or energy or effort. Yeah. Like if you, you if you want to, yeah, you could, you could kind of measure money as like, it's just a, a couple steps removed of the way that human beings interact with the sunlight, right? Like the sunlight beams down on the earth and it grows the grass, which the cows eat. And then we, you know, chop up the cows and we make steaks out of them or like it grows the trees or it makes the, it makes the, like the, the, whatever, you know, like it's just the, the thing that powers all the life on the earth. So I, I suppose there's, there's things on, on earth that aren't powered by the sun, but like, oh, energy, energy, I should say energy is, is just basically a, several steps removed of the sun, whether it's like compressed coal that we're burning or oil or whatever, but like money money is just the way that you measure like how much somebody else has manipulated or moved or 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 messed with you know something close to the surface of the earth or told other people how to mess with something close to the surface of the earth that comes from the book bullshit jobs by the way which is very very excellent book um 
but yeah, money is a great way to, to, to measure everything. Just a couple steps removed of energy and you can measure, you can measure the efficiency of something by how much it costs. So like if something costs a lot to do, then it's not efficient, you know, because somebody somewhere will find a way to make it efficient and therefore make money off of it and you know, yada, yada, yada. So like if, if it's more expensive to recycle plastic bottles than it is to throw them away, then that means that it's, it's more efficient to throw away your plastic bottles than it is to recycle them because everything's like essentially measured in measured in money. So end of, end of my rant. I'm sorry. I keep going like off topic here with all these, all these little rants and things. All good. We are just going to do a smooth segue transition into the next topic, which is the, what we've talked about in the past as the brain trust, or in this book's analogy, it is the, the truth seeking pod, AKA how do you surround yourself with people that you could reliably use to cultivate good ideas and really take a look and critique your own thought process. Yeah, th there's one right he right here that works pretty well. It's these two right here. Yep, is this it's the all the, both like, show off the the tattoos. Oh, the fucking yeah. Let's see iron that time of the stream. There it is. There yeah, it baby, is. there it is. <laughs> so no, but like so so there's there's plenty of places where you guys can can get like good account. Of, like our community is a good example of that. Like this podcast is a good example of that. Uh, the fucking, like the, the CMC, the, the things that Charlie and Miguel run, like, um, like your, your football club or whatever that you're a part of, or, you know, your fencing group, or if you're a part of bungalows for bachelors, or if you're part of like, you know, whatever fucking Andrew Tate's war room, or if you're in like, I don't know, Donald Trump's like millionaire collection club, NFT zone or something, or if you're, or if you're like a member of the proud boys, or if you're part of like Antifa, or if you're part of whatever, like all of these organizations are basically like, so some of them are good some of them bad right um and that's all subjective and whatnot but like it's it's essentially just like a group of people that get together and do things and then hold each other accountable right and the more like the more accountability and growth there is the more like objectively good the group is right so when we started the dgen roundtable it was basically like we all had a whole bunch of ideas and we wanted to like like shoot them back and forth across each other and then we're like shit we should record this and then we're like shit i guess other people might like to listen or something, or we could put it, just put it up on YouTube and that's way easier than like storing it all on all of our phones separately. And then, you know, like eventually, you know, people started watching us and here we are with a thousand, a thousand subs and stuff. So that's pretty cool. But like you guys want to, you guys need to find like groups of people and communities that will hold you accountable, that will act as your brain trust, where you can give them the good, the, like you can give them your like, Hey, this is my plan. This is what I'm doing. Like yada, yada, yada. These are these. This is my problem. This is my solution. What do you guys think? Or this is something that happened to me, and then I responded this, that, and the other way, right? Like these these little like brain trusts are are freaking are like on the freaking ball, man. So like, go start your own little DJ roundtable, or hop into our Telegram and and come hang out with us, or you know, go go meet up with your neighbor and like go mow lawns together, and then talk about your like girlfriend problems or or whatever the fuck. Like create a brain trust. Get yourself a That's get yourself a brother. That's true. All that great I want to ask you guys, what did you identify about her concept of this idea as opposed to like the more generalized versions that we've seen in the past? Because in my opinion, this one was very directed and pointed and wanted to see what you guys picked up from this idea of the, the truth seeking pod. So like what separates her idea from the other ones? For the folks at home, can you give a quick synopsis of, of her idea? For yes. those who might not have read. Yes. So this one specifically with the truth seeking pod, it is, it is trying to emphasize accuracy, accountability, and openness to diverse ideas. It is a group that is dedicated focused to, it is a group dedicated to focused scrutiny for a specific objective. And there even was a point where she said that like, you can theoretically like bounce ideas off other people. However, scrutinizing ideas with just some random person, there's a decent chance they're going to take it the wrong way and might be a little offended by you just critiquing them. So in this case, she says, like, make sure you get people with very similar with similar goals, not similar mindsets, but similar goals. Like you're all trying to, like, solve the same problem. Anyone want to hop on or I'll jump on this? Will's going to go. I'm going to jump on it. All right. So. <laughs> Um, I think that, I think that her method is great for people who are like trying to problem solve and trying to like change things in like our solution oriented, right? 
and there's a couple different ways to to slice to slice this pie is you could either be solution oriented you could be emotionally oriented or you could be um um fuck what was the what was the other one uh shit I'm going to reference another author here, Gretchen Rubin, who another friend of mine is very fond of. Gretchen talks about like whenever someone is telling you about an issue that they have, there's generally like three different responses that they want to have to that issue. One is they want to be hugged. The other one is they want to be heard. The other one is they want to be helped. Sometimes it's a combination of the three of them. But like, like when, when people have a problem, they either want advice, they want validation, or they want... Um, um, or they, or they want like comfort. So with, with these types, with this type of, uh, of, of brain trust thing that she's talking about, that, that Anne's talking about in this book is she's talking about the helped, the helped version, which is basically like, you know, I have this, I have this issue. I don't know how to solve it. I need like advice and things. Not everyone wants advice as she also says in the book. And you know, like Zenith said earlier, some people want to be heard just like validated. So it's like, Hey, I just need to tell you my story and I don't want to hear advice. I just need to get this shit off my chest and, you know, just, I need somebody to listen or, or whatever the case may be. Um, and then some people like want to be comforted or whatever. And, you know, this is, this is like what, like, this is the, the TV trope of like, Oh man, men will never understand women because the woman comes up and like talks and complains about like all these problems that she has. And then the, and then the guy's like, Oh, this is the solution to your problem. Like most often when girls are telling you their problems, they don't want solutions. What they really want is to either be heard or to be hugged. They don't want to be helped, generally speaking. Um, but like this is the uh, this this these are the the thing that Anne's talking about is a more practical solution to like solving real life problems and and things of that nature. So uh, I'm sure that there, there's other there's other things out there that exist for people like therapy, whether it's alcohol anonymous anonymous where where it's like. This that's like the, I guess I guess it's a combination of all three of those alcohol anonymous is because they they do the hugging thing, they do the hearing thing, and they do the um the uh, the helping thing. So like there's there's also and I think she uses Alcoholics Anonymous in the book as an example as well. But um those are those are I think some of the some of the difference between like her specific example and some of the other ones in real life. I like it, gentlemen. Any thoughts? Nothing that I could put on top of that. Fair enough. I was going to say <laughs> one of the one of the things that I found refreshing about her approach to the brain trust in this case is that it's very directed and pointed. And like Will was just alluding to, it's that sometimes when people come to you for advice, what they want you to do is just to affirm their bad decision making or whatever they already believe. Yep. But in this case, she specifically is saying like, look. The brain, this, the, the truth seeking pod, we are here to seek the truth. We are not here to vent or be emotional. Granted, if we're playing large poker tournaments every once in a while, just like getting just the bad beats over and over and getting sucked out by the, by the bad odds, d can it weigh on you? Yeah, absolutely. However, at the same time, the point of all of the people being together and directing your focused energy is you try to improve the decision making process. It's you are there to to expose your own flaws and understand how you can be better. The only way to do that is if you are looking to actually improve, not just feel good about the decisions you're already making. So with this one, even when she does give that disclaimer of like, Hey, this is not something you do with the general public. You do not just like try to seek truth with the general population because odds are they're not ready for it, nor do they want it. You got to have that specific goal. You got to get everybody with their guns pointed in the same direction. Granted, you're all going to be very different people. How you approach the problem is supposed to be different. But the goal that you're seeking is should theoretically all be the same, a.k.a. how do we make the best decisions we possibly can? So in this case, I think that she, it, this, is one of, this is the most detailed view of the brain trust. Because I think one of the things that a lot of people get is like the, the TikTok guru, surround yourself with the wealthiest people possible so that way you'll be wealthy. It's like, all right, cool. Now you're just sitting in a room with billionaires. You have no way to relate to them. You have no idea what to ask them. You're just going to try to sit there awkwardly and listen to them. And then eventually they might just kind of look at you and be like, what are you doing here? Like, what, why am I around you? So with this case, it's very much like, look, we want points. We want counterpoints and we want to be able to test these things and getting the people together for this specific goal of improving your decision-making ability. This is one of those ones that I think you can actually look to as more of the, the definitive how to example of work with other people and like use that gray matter in your brain to solve problems better. 
Yeah, one point I'll add to that is uh, it, when you create these groups, you have to put yourself with people that are actually going to hold you accountable. If, if you're not going to be with a group that's going to hold you accountable, like you said, hearing what you want to say, affirmation, that doesn't really work. I mean, it's nice, but at the end of the day, if you have something you want to accomplish, if somebody's not giving you honest feedback, then, then your discussions are worthless. Yeah, sure. I, that's a great point, Farmer Jay, actually. So one of the things that we, you know, it's a little unknown secret is that inside this iron tattoo is also an implant of a little uh, two million volt uh, little taser thing. <laughs> and so when one of us is not strong and doesn't get in the cold water, <laughs> you just push the button. Ah! <laughs> yeah, iron workers are a different breed. I don't know what's wrong with them. <laughs> These are the boys that climb the towers for fun. So built different, indeed. They are. They are. You should see them on the job site. They're there's there's something else. Can't so, confirm. Farmer Jay, you brought up a really good topic, which I want to touch on, which is the idea of accountability. This is a, definitely a personal opinion on this one, which is that I think the word accountability in today's day and age, especially throughout the military and also throughout the corporate world, is thrown out as a buzzword, and people don't actually understand it it's like one of those things is like oh what do we what do we need to improve the company oh we need accountability we should we should add more accountability it's like accountability is not an action that you do it's not like a specific thing that you can turn on or off accountability is something that you are either doing or not doing it is either something that you want or don't want it is not like a magic like action that you have to like get everyone together you write the report now you have accountability no it's it's a process it's the willingness to be critiqued and make improvements off of it it's being able to internalize your own fa failures or shortcomings and then try to learn from it just because you get up in an office meeting and point at bob and say bob your numbers are low that is not accountability that is just you pointing the finger at bob it's like you it's like yeah sure can you punish someone is that technically accountability yeah in a sense because justice is punitive and also reparative or i guess what's the word I'm looking for but whatever the point is that accountability is something that is actually it's not an action you take it's part of you it's are, are you already doing it are you open to it or are you just trying to justify your own decisions can i go, can I go on a little uh Marine Corps rant here for a second, Zenith. Yes, get on the soapbox. The soapbox okay. is yours. So one of the things, one of the things that they teach in the leadership courses in the Marine Corps, both Corporal's course and Sergeant's course, and hell, I'm pretty sure even Lance Corporal's course doesn't matter. One of the things that they teach is there's there's three mechanisms to leadership that like they are all interwoven with each other and they can't be they can't be split apart. You've got accountability, you've got responsibility, and you've got authority. Or actually, I'm going to list them in in order of importance. Or uh, in order of, of relevance, you've got authority, then you've got responsibility, then you've got accountability, right? So authority is like the ability to like, I, I can tell people what to do. Like this is, this is like, I am in charge and I, and I do this thing. And then uh, second down from that is responsibility. It's like I, as a sergeant, like I have a responsibility to my guys that I have to make sure that what I'm telling them to do is the correct thing and that I'm not sending them to go do some dangerous shit. And like their, their, their decisions and their stuff is, is like, uh, um, like, man, I'm not doing a good job of describing responsibility. Uh, responsibility is basically just like you're you're in charge of people and you need to make sure that they're doing well. And then accountability is like the aspect of you are you are held to the decisions that you make. Now that doesn't necessarily mean that like you're punished or you're promoted for everything, but you need to have ownership of all of the stuff that all of the stuff that you do, both positive and negative, good and bad, all of all of that. I don't remember exactly what it was that that we were that was in the book that uh, that applied to accountability that, that what, what got us started talking on this Zenith? Cause there's something uh, that triggered my thought on this. Yeah. Me going on a rant saying that accountability isn't a buzzword or an action that you can just implement. It's something that you already do. It's, it's a yes. process that you're already taking and you're willing to take on your own. Yeah, and I think we started yeah. on accountability when we were talking about the, what was that group she was talking about? Having a, a group that you can, the actually, yes. uh, the truth seeking pod. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. 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 Okay. Uh, the man, oh, dang, I had it, I had it and I lost it. The, the, the bottom line is that, um, uh, it, it does need to be something that's intrinsic. Like you can't, you can't really like, 
force accountability. It doesn't mean anything when you force it, just like love doesn't mean anything when you force it or like, um, or, or, uh, Man, to kind of to kind of tie. I don't want. I don't really want to tie it back to like the bribes thing specifically. But like when when you have to incentivize people to do the things that they're supposed to be doing, and then you remove the incentive, and then people stop doing the thing that they're supposed to be doing. Then their action of doing the thing didn't mean anything any further than the fact that they were getting rewarded for it. So like all of these all of these characteristics have to be like intrinsically adopted by the people that are implementing them in order for it to be any sort of use. And so like if you try and if you try and enforce people to do things that they don't want to do, then it's not going to mean anything. There's going to be no substance behind it. So I think that that's, that's, that's what I was driving at ultimately when you had, when you had brought that up, Zenith, is that these things just need to be intrinsic. And some of it comes with time. Some of it comes with experience. Some of it is like people are able to learn it without having to, you know, suffer for the lesson. And, you know, there's, there's positives and, and negatives to that aspect as well. But that was, uh, that was about all I had on, on the accountability thing. Fair enough. So when it comes to the the brain trust here or the truth seeking pod, accountability in this case, in my mind, what it looks like is that you are accountable to your own actions and your own decisions. And if your actions are going to influence other people, how whatever input they have with you as well is part of that accountability. It's the idea that my actions and my ideas might affect more people than me. Therefore, whatever I get as a result of that, I am ultimately accountable for. And that is that reflection coming back on me, which is that it's like in crypto. If I lose, if I make bad trades, I am losing money. If I am a like, if I'm a division leader and I'm, I have like six guys under me, any bad thing that I do is not only going to affect my guys, but also how my guys think of me and how they how they're going to work for me in the future, honestly. And it's that team effort that's being the team effort and whatever I get out of what I put into my team, that is me being held accountable for it, which is that if I do good, I'm going to be rewarded. And if I do bad, I'm going to be punished or my life is going to be harder or my guys are going to suffer and they might take it out on me a little bit. It's when it comes to the brain trust though, it's the idea of that the accountability here is using other people who, to help improve yourself. You are trying to improve yourself towards that common goal. In this case, in the book, it is poker players who are there to judge their strategy and understand if they're making the best probable plays. And if they're not, then that means that they're the, the ones that are ultimately losing out and losing money in this case, so to speak. So therefore, they need to improve that to get to that, like, that positive EV or those positive value plays. I do there think that, yeah, that, that we've, we've beat this dead horse quite a bit, but you, I like it. I like yeah. it. That's a good button up. Perfect. Alrighty. Let's talk about, we, uh, we already covered bias. Sweet. Uh, let's Did talk we? about dissenting views. So being a contrarian kind of just means being an asshole a little bit. However, there are useful cases for it. I wanted to ask you guys, what are the, when you're trying to provide opposition for people, we're sort of like a controlled opposition. What are some of the ways that you have found are the best ways to do it? Like, do you have any tips, tricks, tactics, good at stories, examples of like you trying to play the bad guy to help improve someone who's asking you a question? Well, that sort of presupposes, first of all, that the person asking the question wants to be like, wants their actual beliefs challenged. And most of the time in life, people don't want to question the things that are like truly most important to them. So, I mean, it obviously depends on the question and what they're asking. Like if someone's asking about like watermelons and strawberries at the store, then, you know, you can engage in that. But also if they're asking about something that's like, you know, it seems like it's a really genuine, deep question, then f to find out if they're actually open to the like conversation and, and challenging them you need to basically judge their body language, their tone, the words, knowing them as like the past. Like, are they actually willing to be truly challenged? Because if you if you go down a rabbit hole, and I've had like a few conversations in my life with people that, like, I thought these were people that I could talk about anything with, because they would they would always take the emotion out of it. Let's talk about reason. Let's like you know figure this thing out. And sometimes those conversations end in like emotional breakdown and i found out that like oh like there is there is actually a limit to the depth of conversation that i can have here and so you have to understand and like that's framed by someone's life experience so if someone's like 70 
and they've lived in the framework of life that they just understand for 70 years, like you're not going to change that framework without them having to basically totally die to self and be like, well, I've got, I guess, 10 to 20 years of life left and I've been doing it all wrong or like I've, I've been doing it inefficiently or whatever, you know? So um, I don't know. I don't think I answered the question directly, but I, I think <laughs> that it's. No, those are good points. You, you have I to think... be like willing to like take yourself down on a level. And, and so they need to understand that you are trying to do the best thing for them because you love them. Right. To have that conversation really. I love how you took the question that Zenith asked and then you disagreed with it. I just want to point out the fourth. I like, I'm enjoying the fourth <laughs> wall breaking here. And uh, that was, that was very good. Very good explanation. And then, and then you turned it into like a positive spin. And I think that that's the best way to disagree with people is to like say, Hey, this is what I think that's different. And this is, and this is the positive spin and this is how you're going to get better from it. You know, like if you're going to disagree with someone, it needs to be a good sale. Like any good human to human interaction needs to be a good sale where you, where you can find a way to inspire the person to want to hear the words that you're saying, right? Whether it's, whether it's through like, Hey, like you've got this problem and this is the, this, like, I've got the solution right here and I'm going to tell it to you. And like, because I've, I've spoken these words to you, like you're, you're now going to learn something you didn't know earlier and you'll, you'll be all that much better for it. You know, it needs to like, if you're gonna if you're gonna uh, disagree with someone, or if you're gonna criticize, or I, f I forgot what the original word was that we used, but if you're going to offer um, um, like a disagreement with someone, it it will be received so much better if you can sell it in a way that like they're gonna be hungry to to receive that information and everything. What you got, Jay? It looks like you're no, there. Well, well, there's just some people you can't disagree with. Like they're just they're not mentally built for that. Like they're just emotional. And they'll get very yeah. violent with you very quickly. So it's just useless. But yep. like, and you like gotta, I was saying, you have to look at the person and understand what kind of person they are. See if they can have a civil discord with you. If you're willing, if you, if they want to have it, if they don't want to have it, then, I mean, you say whatever you want, but it's going to be pointless. They don't want to hear anything, but they all they want is confirmation of their beliefs. And they're not willing to, they're just not willing to have a discussion about it. It's just final with them. That makes sense. I think there, the, the the author made a very good point with the idea of that. If you're looking to genuinely critique for improvement, people are not, some people just don't want that. Therefore you got to find the ones that are willing to accept it and are willing to actually put accountability into action instead of just throw it at people. So when it comes to actually disagreeing with people or providing that opposite opinion, one of the ways that I think is a useful way to do it is trying to not necessarily attack ideas head on kind of do what sam did which is that if someone is asking you to challenge them and they give you a straight question chances are that the person has already thought about that question therefore they think that they've built up a good response to it so maybe the best way to bolster their defense of this is kind of attack it from a different angle or a different avenue which is that try to expose blind spots which is the idea that they haven't thought of yet and this is where you get that diverse opinion to really help out with something like this. So what I mean by that is like, if you're asking whether or not, like for poker reference, I guess, if you're, if you ask someone like, hey, am I playing the correct amount of hands? You look at the range of hands that they play and they say that it's like, okay, cool. Are you playing this range of hands in the right positions? It's, it's kind of adding that third axis of like expanding it or tagging it from that different angle. It's like, cool. Are you playing these poker hands from the blinds? From the button from middle position early like where how does this adjust how do you change this idea so it's it's the idea of for me it's using your brain to not redo the work of someone else but do new work that has not already been done what do you guys think about something like that i i i like where you're where you're going and um uh oh uh oh there goes the choo choo train. Uh oh. No. Um, man, what were you just saying? Oh, so technicalities uh, of of Not of engaging. Like, Not sorry, so the technicalities, but attacking from different angles, which is yeah. expanding expanding the question 
or trying to ask a new or different question. Yeah. So I wanted to like feed in a little bit of like sort of strategy that can be behind the feeding the question part. And whenever like this comes from salesmanship, from a uh, straight line method of Wolf of Wall Street, right? So pace, pace, lead. So if you are trying to disagree with someone and you want them to like genuinely consider your different idea, they need to believe that they're that you're on their side first. Even if you're not, even if you are, it doesn't matter. They need to understand and believe that you are. So if they're asking questions, you need to very much like appear that like you're agreeing with them, right? You're like, oh, I, I could see that. Like I never thought about it like that before. Uh, like interesting idea, you know? And like you you basically go into that once or twice and, and you you get that momentum going. And once the momentum's built, then you can start to like try to turn the car a little bit and be like, well, what about this other idea? Like, do you, how do you think this applies or like something like that where it's like you've you've gotten the momentum and they understand that you're on their team and then you can try to direct them to the, the thought that you want them to think about that's all i'm thinking that's good sales i like it makes sense to me perfect so are we good on uh on this topic ready to shift gears a little bit i think so all righty sounds good mrs producer i am going to share something with you if you do not mind excellent should be a pdf all right, so next part I want to talk about is the idea of how how have you found ways to separate what is skill versus what is luck? This is the PDF document prevent, uh, provided with Thinking and Bets. There's some good stuff in here, but this learning loop right here is the one that I want to focus in on, which is that when you think about critiquing your actions and your decision-making, you obviously start with like betting on future and then you move down to learning loop two, which is the old, which is the, the more complex way of looking at things, which is you have a belief or an idea, you make a bet on it. You look at the outcomes. Learning loop two is now you're adding a second bet on it to go back to an original belief. And then learning loop two, this is where you have to determine was your outcome based on luck or was it based on skill? So how do you know when you're lucky versus good? When, mm, if, if you're good, you have the ability to manipulate like all of the circumstances. So like you look at it as kind of like the, the beginning of the serenity prayer where it's like, God grant me the, the, the peace to accept the things that I cannot change and like the strength to change the things that I can something along those lines. Like there's, there's a certain amount of things that are within your control and that's where the good comes in. And then there's a certain number of things that are outside of your control, which is just like, you know, where the luck comes in. If you can manipulate all the things in your control to maximum efficiency, then you're going to get the best outcomes. And that's, that's like where the good comes in. And if you can't, and you just get lucky then Hey, you got lucky, you know, like ever, ever, like even a, even a broken clock is wrong twice a day or something like that. I don't know if that analogy works for this, um, uh, for this, uh, uh, example, but like that's that's the difference as best as I see it. Does anyone have a different thought or disagree? Perhaps I don't have a different thought, but I have more to add. Yeah. So what I think about is like, okay, if we're going to talk about luck, well, again, let's just try to define the luck in from their perspective. They're describing luck in this case when you're playing poker. Luck is pretty much just pure chance. So I, this doesn't totally apply to playing poker, but in life in general, the good things that happen to you that come from luck is the combination of preparedness and having opportunities. And so basically, if you want to get better luck, right? And we've talked about this on these streams before, then you make yourself more prepared for a wider variety of things. And you try to take like almost all the opportunities that you can to do things. Um, and generally like that's going to give you the, those little luck boosts, even, even if they're like quote luck or not, what matters is that you have the opportunity now and now you can, you know, grow that 10,000 hours. You can be the person born on January 1st, like all these other books that we're reading, like it all ties into sort of the same thing and that like by like this, the skill part is it can feed back into like reproducing more luck for yourself if you're paying attention and you put yourself in the right positions. That's I would say they're sort of related in that way. When you're playing poker, not so much. 
you can't really affect what the dealer is doing with the cards. But fair enough. Farmer J, any thoughts? Uh, just adding to what Sam said that, yeah, just luck is just absolute pure chance. Uh, because you can leave for work every day 30 minutes early. But if something happens on that freeway where there's a deadly crash and that freeway completely shuts down, that's something you have no control over. You're not going to get to work on time. Just an analogy most people can understand. If something happens on the way to work and you have no control about it, well, you prepared. You leave on. You leave before. You leave 30 minutes before you're supposed to, you usually get to work 30 minutes before, and that's usually going to happen every single day, but there's always a chance that that's not going to happen or that you're going to die on the road to work. It's not probable, but there's always a chance of these things happening and these things you absolutely have no control over. I like it. All right. I'm going to throw out an idea here, which is that I think that the, the idea that you gave with, the, the possibility of being, being late for work always does exist. But what if skill is having the knowledge to know that this possibility exists? Therefore, I want to act in a way that is going to maximize upside and minimize downside, which is that leaving yeah. 30 minutes early, which is you understand that there's a chance that if it, if, if it takes me 25 minutes to drive to work on average, there might be one or two days in a month where it takes me like 40, 45 minutes to drive there on average, in which case you have to ask yourself, all right, I know this knowledge. I know the probability of it. How do I effectively put this into action? Is it that I always leave 45 minutes early every day? Or is it that I, I at least like, maybe I can like give a heads up to my boss or something and be like, Hey, I understand that like traffic is might be bad some days, but typically I'm here five minutes early every time consistently. And you show that track record. It's, it's finding that third solution, that fourth solution, which is that yep. I am using my knowledge to make a practical benefit for me, which is a building the reliability of being on time to work. And then those two or three times or one or two times a month that you might be like cutting it close or maybe like a hair late to work. You're able to be like, Hey, it was a little bit bad. I knew it was going to be this bad. It's not, it's not, it's not a big deal at this point. It has been minimized. The yep. downside has been reduced. The, like the, said, um, go ahead. Go ahead. Jay. Say, skills. Like, like you said, something you have to work on. Uh, let's take it like to video games. When you're playing games, right? There's a skill level. What skill level are you? Well, you just don't get to that level. You actually have to practice and work at it before you're able to get to that skill level. Just like they're talking about 10,000 hours on usually in any trade after 10,000 hours, you're somewhat competent, but you have to build that skill set from starting from absolutely knowing nothing to being the errand boy or the gopher to actually uh, being able to go out there and just do everything by yourself. It's a skill set you slowly build. Zenith, you gave us the two poisoned cups for your solution and you described the other cups as for the solution, <laughs> but what you didn't mention Sorry, I set you up. is why, why like, like think that thinking outside the box thing, right? If you want to control your luck, why don't you just not have a 30 minute commute and move like next to your office? Right? Like that's, you know, you, that's when you start weighing like, and the skill becomes part of your, Ability to like think, oh, what else? What are the factors that I can change to affect my luck? Now the luck yep. doesn't even matter. It's not even part of the equation. Yep. There you go. You That's a big part engineer right there. it. A lot of a lot of high skill players want to try to reduce variance and luck as much as physically possible. And if you have the ability to do that, that's where that skill can really shine. And we all know that guy who who is late to work like every other day and he's always like oh man external external factor this or unforeseen circumstance why or yada 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 there's like there's there's the there's the opposite side of the spectrum too that's like hey you're not unlucky you suck at planning you know and it's like that's something that's the, you don't want to be that guy so don't be that guy learn how to best manipulate your environments move in move in right next to your your work or like learn how to wake up early and drive or do the things that you can do to take control of like all of as many circumstances that are within your like authority bubble as possible love it 
Alrighty, I have one last diagram that I want to touch on, and this is the idea that your bet should theoretically be incorporating different possible outcomes. Theoretically, there's an infinite infinite amount of possibilities. However, if you can kind of imagine that, like anything above 1% is significant enough to make it on the tree. So when you do think about all these possible futures, this is where we start to define what all the options are and then what probability we can assign to them. So at this point, I do want to walk the boys through a bit of an exercise, which is that I want to test us and see what looks, what actually putting a plan into action looks like in the field that we are all involved in, which is good old cryptocurrency, baby. So with that being yes. said, let's go over to trading view. This is producer. If you do me the honors, by the way, while I'm transitioning, I do have one shout out. I want to make, we have Charlotte Nightstar the werewolf stopping in saying hi, Sam looking rad wearing those dark sunglasses at night. <laughs> There you go. Uh, Agent Smith is looking good over there. Love to see it. Absolutely. Look at him go. Alrighty. So, Excellent. gentlemen, I have pulled up in front of us the Bitcoin chart for the monthly time scale. I want to do the idea of long, short versus long term planning and building probabilities. So, with that being said, based on all the information that we have, let's try to start constructing a range of possibilities. So let's do short term first. I'll actually drop us down to the week time scale. So somebody uh, take the lead on this one. Where do you think that like let's draw out one month on time. If you're about to tell ask us to take the lead, Zenith, you should know that none of us are TA guys. I don't know about Farmer J. I'm going to presume that none of us except for you are TA guys. I know well, what this chart is saying, but I'm not sure, like, where are we I'm going I'm not necessarily here? saying TA, but I was going to say, Will, I thought you are the, the TA guru. So if you oh, had to... Chart oh, goes wait. up. Chart goes up. Okay, so here, let's... Uh, I think you are my... Yep. Do you okay. see the color so, of the backlight, Zenith? What color is the color? It's yep. green, baby. It's green. It it's is green. green. Okay, so how about this? Well, what do you think the probability that Bitcoin does not move in one month, that we're going to be stuck here at 66,000? What probability? That it doesn't move at all? Yeah. 100%. It's stuck. The, all They turned off all of the, the miners and all of the um, exchanges are all just flatlined. Wow, that guy is driving. Um, no, nah, but for real, it's it's a it's a it's not a hundred percent. It's actually a hundred and ten percent. So let me adjust my numbers here. Now I don't I don't know. Like uh, I I will say that there is a there is zero percent that it doesn't move at all. There is a percent greater than it's it's like uh, oh shit what what do they say on Geico up to fifteen percent or more? So. For those of you who who never watch Geico commercials, you could you could save up to fifteen percent or more. Which, for those of you that don't know how numbers work, that's every single number that exists. Any number up to fifteen percent, including fifteen percent or more than fifteen percent, you could save a number that exists if you if you ship, switch to Geico, right? So I would say that our our chance of Bitcoin being at the same price at the end of a month is up to fifteen percent or more. Fair enough. Okay. So how about this? What if we do what they talk about in the book, which is working backwards? I'm going to throw out yeah. some numbers and I want you to give me the probability. Uh, what are the odds that we hit $200,000 Bitcoin in one month? I don't know, man. Not Zero. very likely at all. All right, 30%. here we go. So I'm hearing 0%. So obviously we know that this is not possible. At the same time, what are the odds that we get $10,000 Bitcoin in one month? Probably zero. Also highly unlikely. Probably zero as well. Okay. So that means that the number has to be somewhere between these two. So this is where we can start really building our probability curve because we know the upper and lower limits or these very extreme examples, which means the answer has to be somewhere between these two. So if we want to use, I don't know, something like historical data, we could look at the last five bars because this is the weekly. So in those five bars, we have effectively gone about 10% of a move. So if you want to say that there's like a, we'll call it a coin flip chance 
then that means that there's a 50% chance that we're going to stay 10% up or down. So theoretically, that means that we could be basically Draw like a little like, shotgun blast. Yeah, kind of like that. So now what we're going to end up with, if we do this correctly, in my opinion, is we should uh, end up with something that looks like a, a standard distribution or the normal distribution, a.k.a. the bell curve, which means that we're going to have a lot higher probability closer to where we already are. And then we're going to have lower probabilities the further out we go, a.k.a. the zero percent that we already identified. Yeah. So if we okay. have, I don't know, let's look at some other larger moves that are possible. We could have something like this, which is maybe like a 30, 37 percent correction. And then if we look at it the other way, that could be something like a 61% gain. So if we look at that, we translate that over here, then that means that this is less likely, but it's possible that we get a move all the way up to like 108,000. But this is so far, it's such a small amount of time that we could probably attribute this to maybe like 5% or less. Because this is, this is that rare chance. So now that we know... that we have about a 5% chance of moving this far. If you're going to try to act on this information, how do you how could you do something like that? We only have a few limited options, which is if you have no bitcoin, you can buy some or if you have some, you can sell or you can do the third answer, which is hold. So, in this case, holding is we, is essentially the same as buying, I would say. Okay. That's that's yeah. That's fair. So, when you look at something like this, we have very high probability in the center and we have very low probability going outside, which means that your upside and your downside are reduced. So in this short term scenario, it seems likely that the correct answer is if you want to buy more at a better price, odds are you're not going to get that much of a better price. So is it really any difference buying now or later in this five week time period? No. Uh, no. No. So in that case, <laughs> it, it, it kind of makes sense that buying in this time period, you're not going to get any huge advantage or disadvantage. Now, let's shift out farther, which is that let's look at we want to make the best. We we are the, the four year, uh, the four year cycle believers. Uh, tch, 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 uh, where is 2020? I need November of 2025. It's right over there. Right around there. So cool. This is our end date now. This means that because we're so farther out, what are our probabilities going to look like? Do you think they're going to be tighter or more spread out? Uh, more spread out. More spread out. Okay. So we can also theoretically go back and use some historical data as well, which is let's look at, ba -ba -da -ba, let's do a top to top. So we have, this is the 2017 top to the 2021 top, and that was an increase of about 257%. So if we want to do something similar, then that means that we can do the same thing and drag it out to about over here as well. There you go. There's your, your four years. Mm. And that is if we did exactly what we did in the last one, we would end up right here. So can you start to assign some probabilities about, do you think it's, do you think it's likely that we end up at $250,000 Bitcoin at the end of this four year cycle? Like what's the probability? It's not unheard of. It's I mean, not it's unheard like, of. if you just look at the slope of the line and you extrapolate, it's probably going the same way then sure it's just a, it's like there's so many other so this is this is like there's so many other factors that like we're looking at poker we're not looking at chess right so there's a, there's a whole bunch of things that we cannot calculate here like the future we, do, we don't know what's going on in the future we don't know what happens with news outlets we don't know what happens with like people with boatloads of money we don't know what happens with countries adopting we don't know what happens with like china shutting off all the internet again like there's so many so many things that can't be accounted for that's fair. But if we go for, if we try to reduce it down to things that we think are greater than 1%, let's try to identify our upper and lower bounds. So over the course of getting out to this four-year cycle, do you think we're going to end up higher or lower than we are right now? Is there a, any chance that we are lower than we are right now? 
I would say yeah. that the chance for it being lower is smaller than it is the chance of us being higher. Fair enough. So that means that all the probability in this area is going to be higher than the probability in area like this. Yep. Which means that we we believe that we are more confident we're going to end up somewhere in here than we are somewhere down here. Yeah, so because... The, the higher the range, though, the less likely it becomes. Exactly um, correct. So something still, like up here... Yeah, it's still possible, but not probable. But that possibility still exists. But like you said, the more center you are, the more that's likely to happen. Okay, not guaranteed. so now we... Exactly. That's great thinking, Farmer Jay. So I want to ask you this. Based on this range that we've established, based on probability, knowing our possible courses of action, and we have some Bitcoin now, and we have some cash, where can you construct a play on how to make some money, theoretically? Like, how would you do it? Go all in on Bitcoin. Cool. So we're going to buy Bitcoin here. And then what are we going to do with it? Do you plan on selling it at any point? Uh, I suppose you, based on, like you said, what that chart looks like. And if you believe in the four-year cycles, probably cash out towards the top. And you're going to have to give yourself a range of when do you believe that is, when it's highly probable, around what dates are this most probable to be the top. Except you don't really know, but based on past performance, you can grab that and actually uh, – make it make an educated guess of what's probable to happen and what ranges uh and what ranges are are more probable than others like that very high top it's probably not going to happen so you would probably look in to see what range what range can you expect to take profit and maybe dca out at that point like give yourself a range between this time period and that time period if it reaches between these levels and that level i want to start slowly dcaing out Possibly. That's fair. So let's go with that idea, which is between these two dates here, which just randomly was drawn was like February or we'll say March of 2025 and end of November 2025. We want to make a play, which is starting to slowly DCA out over these times. And what's your idea with this? Because we're selling at multiple different times, we're going to capture what? Uh, well, you're going to be able to capture that price appreciation and turn it back into cash. And exactly. Then, and, then, and then, if, like I said, if you believe in the four-year charts, then there's a possibility that if you still want Bitcoin, then you can possibly buy it at a lower price than you actually sold it for compounding your crypto. That makes sense. So based on everything that we've talked about here, we now have somewhat of an idea of what we want to do which is there's a time frame we want to be selling and we have an understanding that we're probably going to end up somewhere around this green circle. It's improbable that we go to the top red circle, which would be awesome if we did. But at the same time, we now have to, uh, there's a possibility that we have this problem here. So now we can actually start take what we've, because now we've created a strategy going into this. So now I want to ask you guys some questions. So let's say chart goes to here how do you feel about the system that we created euphoric euphoric okay now how about this now how do you feel about this the system that you you created feel like what are the odds made. cool this is a this is a good system because you effectively captured a lot of this price right in here and you minimized your downside risk because you got out at a good time. All right, second question. Yes. How do you feel about your problem? How do you feel about your system now? Good. Still? Good. We we oh, only ended up at about 100, 102,000. Yeah, it's so we're good. the lower what, side. It's not euphoric. Um, what do the yellow lines mean? This is the time frame in which we're trying to sell. Oh, okay. You've already made the decision that we're going to sell during this because we believe that there's a higher probability that we're going to go down after this. Okay. Now, if the price is that low, will you actually stick to that game plan, though? I think that's a problem a lot of people are going to have. I mean, you, you, drew your, you drew yourself the possibilities. You knew this was a possibility, but 
all you could see was the the higher end of where you could end up instead of if you look if you looked at it subjectively between these times that's basically the top no matter what the number you're still within that range so you're in that range but you expect it higher so are, are you going to stick to that game plan that you gave yourself it's a good game plan if you stick to it regardless of the range because you're still up but are you going to do it probably not that's fair all right follow-on question how do you feel about this plan now Oof. it is what it is all the right. feelings don't matter they do matter but like buy back in yeah yeah, Isaac and Newton it. How do you feel about it now? Hey, feel better. Like the the feelings the feelings are lit, are just like <laughs> time based. If you wait long enough, your feelings will go away or they won't and you'll die. That's very Well, fair. I guess in that case they go away anyways. <laughs> so but at the same time, the whole point of this is I want to ask we did some thinking beforehand to try to create these areas of probability and that not just like vertically, but also horizontally. So based on all the different options that we've laid out here, was the system a good system? Because in what you thought was the most probable scenario, you captured a, a good chunk of the profits. In some of these more improbable scenarios, you didn't do as good, but you didn't do catastrophic. So do you think that because you use this system, the, the value that you gained through the more probable ways was more valuable than the losses in the less probable ways. What I'm asking is if you made a hundred thousand dollars and what you thought was a 60 or like a 75% chance, then that kind of equates to like $75,000 in value, as opposed to you could have made, or you could have lost like $200,000, but it had a 25% chance of coming to fruition in which in that case, that would be pretty much like a 50,000 or 50,000 gain or loss. Do you what, what I'm saying here? She one of the things she talks about in the book is that a loss feels way worse than a gain. The, exactly. A loss feels way worse than a gain feels good. If you lose, you feel two times worse for the same number than if you made the same numbers gain. So like you will feel the exact same emotion from a $50,000 loss as you would a $100,000 gain, like the same severity of emotion. So like that is something to consider is like as human beings, we are more prone to, be loss averse than we are to be like celebratory of like crazy gain and whatnot. And in this crypto sphere, we're kind of just like hijacking our, our emotional system with all these crazy numbers and this crazy volatility. So that's only the strong will survive or the stupid. Hey, one of the, one of the phrases I've heard is that there's only two kind of people that make money in the crypto market. And that is either the dumb dumbs or the super IQs and yep. everyone else in the middle just does not. So it's possible, but I guess time for moment of self-reflection. So did any of that make sense? Is that what this book is talking about? Is that how you use probabilities and confidence curves to make decisions? I think that's a good, that's a good use case. It's not something I'm particularly fond of, but I can see how, like how the, the application of that information to that specific knowledge point is useful and relevant to the book. So. Fair. Yes, Sam. What do you think? Yeah, I think I think so. I mean, that that was a very good, like, application of understanding your probabilities, right? Your your high your your high probability, low gain, low probability, high gain. Like, understanding that balance and understanding like where you are splitting over the, you know, the fifty fifty point. Like, if if you are expecting you know, and presuming that you're sort of accounted for all of the data, which we don't have, you know, it's just probabilities, then yeah, I mean, that's something that you can make moves with, with your money. And so like, if you want to like, go get a CD and make $10 a year on your money, and you put in 100 million, then you can go do that. And you know, you're going to get that 10 bucks. So fair enough. Farmer J, what do you think? probabilities did that make sense do you think it's useful uh i think it is useful but you have to understand that even using probabilities you're not always going to win 
Uh, but if you're going to use that strategy of probabilities, then you should probably use it overall and not just from occasion to occasion. Because if you do, there's going to you just you're probably going to fail and then you're not going to want to stick to that plan. So, I mean, if that if you're going to live your life based on probabilities, then you should probably stick to the plan like you drew up in the chart what the plan was. Right. And if you stuck to that plan, you would have made some money. You probably wouldn't have made as much as if you were with your emotions, uh, especially the chart didn't go up as high as you wanted. And then after the four year cycle, it kind of had that last bump that you drew. So if you would have been emotional and say, no, I'm going to it's going to go higher. You probably would have held down to it, but you wouldn't have held to, to your plan. And there was also the probability that it just could have gone straight down. And then you would have been out. Of, you just would have screwed yourself because you didn't stick to the plan. So you're not always going to win. But if you stick to your plan of probabilities, chances are that you, you're going to win most of the time, but not all the time. There you go. That's, That's honestly perfect analysis right there, especially what you said. You had a point earlier, too, which is that you can modify and adjust the plan as you see fit and need to over time. However, at the same time, though, picking and choosing when you use this kind of thinking and when you don't, that could really screw you up. Yeah, if you're so if you're like going to go around making a bunch of bets, to people flipping coins like downtown, you're going to go to start betting money, flipping coins. If you are operating under the assumption that like you understand probabilities and if you flip a coin, once you got a 50 50 chance of getting ahead you flip it twice you now have a 25 percent chance of like getting two heads right so you extrapolate that out and if you're basically would if you just decide that i am only going to bet heads every time then there is a 50 50 chance like throughout the whole thing but if you start playing the game of like trying to interpret and play with like expected results for like higher gains like you start you're going around there and you're like betting the same amount of money and you're just like basically picking like heads or tails or whatever and you keep getting like you're going to only pick tails in the beginning and the heads keeps coming up then what's going to happen like and you decide like you know what heads keeps coming up and therefore because i understand statistics it's more likely that i'm going to get a tails now but you can't act on that decision because it's still 50 50 every time you flip the coin so what is yeah. that called when uh, past performance does not in, like in in statistics? Uh, oh, is it outcome. a? Are you asking about like a fallacy or something? The the thing that Sam said. Yeah, so like, there's two ways to to like calculate, and I, it's been a minute since I've been in statistics, but there's two ways that like there's two probabilities that you can calculate. There's like the probability of a result, and then there's the expected outcome of a result. And so like, there's two different things. You know, if you the, I think I think if I'm unless I'm wrong, I think the expected outcome is like our emotional instinct, right? You take coin flip times number of times you're flipping it, and you're going to expect it to do a certain thing. But at the end of the day, the probability of the coin flipping is still 50 50. Yeah. If you're doing coin Indep flip independent on outcomes, so you also have a high probability of getting robbed. <laughs> very, true, that? very true. Yes. That's that if you're That's doing coin flips on the street, you're probably have a higher probability of getting robbed than not That's flipping. That's true. Coin. There you go. It's all that information that you don't have outside of the coin flip you forgot to incorporate. Yep. <laughs> Fantastic. All right, gentlemen, we are going to start wrapping from here. I think this is an excellent discussion. Thank you for allowing me to strain you all with my, my example on the charts. But other than that, I want to uh, ask this last question as we also ask you guys where the people can find you, but uh, where does this fall in your, your hierarchy of books? Is this, where is it on the reading list? Is it top priority, moderate, low? Let's start with Sam. Ah, uh, man, thanks for letting me go first. I, you know, it's just really great that I'm, I, I'm better than everyone okay. else. And uh, this is just really, really a good thing. <laughs> Um, wake up and piss um, is that what you're saying no <laughs> so like this book is i think it's it's very important from like a life approach thing this would definitely i i'm i have not heard of this book before i'm very glad that i read it great recommendation thank you for everyone whoever recommended it i don't remember the name <laughs> but yeah if you, i mean if you just are aware that this is a way to live you it's it's kind of like she said in the book and like you know i we, we all know the the words red pill went mainstream and it means a million things now but she was referring to a basic concept in the book of the red pill versus blue pill right 
Are you going to now be aware of a reality that exists that you can take advantage of or you can ignore and go back to doing blue pill things, you know? And so like I would say, you know, it's up there. Like being aware is just more important than anything else because then you can decide. If you don't, if you're not aware, you can't decide. So love it. Where can the people find you, Sam? The people can find me at Linktree forward slash Samuel D. Stevenson. All of my stuff is there. And if you want to learn about construction and learn about how it can better your life, check me out. That's what I do. Beautiful. All righty, Farmer Jay, what'd you think of the book? Where does it fall on your your reading list of favorites? Mm, I don't really get a good chance to read the book how I wanted to. Kind of just did it on two days. I would have liked the break in between, but it was actually a good book. Uh, I, I I liked it. Uh, kind of got from it that like everything in life's a bet. That you can, but you can calculate the risk of that bet based on some uh, like a skill set you have or, or how you prepare yourself. But everything in life is, is a bet. Uh, if you take a step, chances are you're not, your foot's not going to give. But sometimes your foot does give and you're going to break it or you get old or whatever it, the case may be. But it, the, basically what I got out of the book is just that everything in life's in bet and you expect a certain outcome. And these there's probabilities of things that are going to happen. But uh, but the probability isn't always what happens. Sometimes there's other things that, that circumstances you have no control, which is the chance part of it, the luck part. There's some things you have no control over in life. But so whenever you do something in life, there's a chance of, of the outcome that you want. If you put yourself in a position, you can actually get it. Excellent. All right. Where can the people find you? Uh, posting memes on the on the chat, Telegram chat. <laughs> the, the one, the one down there, if you can get yes, to it by that scanning right the QR there, code. That QR, that QR code Beautiful. right there. Thank you, Sam. Thank you very much. All righty, my co-host, Will, what did you think of the book? I thought that the book was quite excellent. It uh, it it reminded me of a lot of the philosophies that I've that I've learned through painful trial and error. And I wish that I had read this book sooner in life. So for those of you guys who have not read this book already, I highly recommend it. It's definitely going in in one of my like reread categories. And just the concept of of like, because I always hear life is life is compared to like a chess game, and I I much prefer this poker idea because there's so many so many like variables that are outside of our control, and so many like more probabilities, and so much more like adaptability and learning that comes from just like figuring shit out on the fly and learning how to pick up on patterns and like understanding that the world's not a perfectly like, you know, little, little tiny encapsulated um, system in which there are like only a set number of, of things that can happen. So highly recommend this book. I think it's fantastic and that folks should go and read it for sure. Uh, as far yeah, as where are you guys? Real. Yes. Yes, absolutely. As far as uh, where the guys can, where the folks at home can find me, you guys can find me also in the DGen Roundtable chat. Also, uh, Linktree forward slash Will Stevenson is my uh, is my little collection of the work that I've done, the places I am, the things that I'm doing. Um, the next the next place you can find me is t.me forward slash hex underscore meetup. Just as I have written right down here in this little subheader thing i'm currently in essentially illinois slash indiana i'm just right on the border over by uh vicen vicen is so if any of you guys are in the area drop me a message on twitter fucking send me a dm on telegram telegram is the best way to reach me but uh if you don't want to use telegram then send me a message on twitter find my instagram page find my facebook page send me a matter there the telegram is the best because it'll always send messages through sometimes facebook and Instagram, they'll like think that people are spamming because they don't know who you are or whatever. Um, and then, you know, Twitter is the next best option. So you guys can find me at, at Linktree forward slash Will Stevenson. Also t.me forward slash hex underscore meetup. If you guys are hexkins and you want to meet up. Also, I want to do a quick shout out to the Pulse Chain Tour. They have added the Richard Hart, the Richard Hart uh, uh, hearing that's going on on October 24th to their list of things that they're going to be attending. And I am very, very excited. I'm going to do my very best to make that one. This is going to be excellent and outstanding. I'm super stoked to meet all the crazy cool Hexkins. And something that I think would we would do very well from as a community is if we just showed up to support Richard Hart and his fight for like his, his basically taking the bullet and fighting for our freedoms, fighting for our speech, fighting for 
you know, the world to be a better place from this tyrannical, crazy, uh, the, the tyrannical, crazy place that the world is trying to be and take away our rights, take away our sovereignty, take away all that stuff. The best thing that we can do is show up to this court, like court hearing thing, like be super positive, be super happy, be like full of love and, and wonderfulness and like try and avoid like the nasty, annoying, like garbage protesting that people do and just try and make the world a better place show up and like and prove to everyone who's got cameras over there like how awesome in a community we are and how how wonderful and how great we're going to make the world um and then following that join the dj round table you guys just want what was to go that i said you guys just want to go and get drunk <laughs> so that like i'm gonna i'm gonna give you guys a little bit so i'm not gonna I, i'm i'm not you know what, i'm just not gonna, gonna do that but like ugh. yeah it, 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 it'll be fun. I had an idea earlier that it'd be super funny to just be like sitting outside the courtyard steps selling hot dogs with like, you know, paper napkins yeah. and stuff with hex merch on them. Like that, that would be does. like, yeah, I don't think I didn't have the idea about the hex merch and stuff. I just wanted to sell hot dogs outside the courtyard because I think that'd be a cool way to, to provide value to the world. But like, realistically, I don't think that's a possible thing. I'm sure that I would like get, you know, sent to sent to, I don't know, hot dog jailer or, or something. But anyways, join our Telegram, guys, because we talk about this stuff and much, much more. And after you're done watching us on this stream, hop on over to the F and Hangout, uh, RG3 and Wild SJ and whoever else is joining them. I'm not entirely sure what's going on. But you guys can catch a lot of super cool Hex conversation going on over there. Join our Telegram. Here is the uh, here is the, the, the QR code for doing it. I already dropped the link in the chat. I'm going to go ahead and do it again because I love you guys just that much. Oh, that's the wrong one. That's my link tree. I'll go ahead and type it out and then drop it while Zenith is closing us out. Zenith, where can the folks find you? What do you got going on in the near future? Yes, sir. People can find me immediately after this on the FN Hangout. I'm actually the one that's going to be hosting it. So we're trying to wrap here quickly so I can jump over there and start uh, start going over there. But you can find me on Twitter and Instagram at ZenithDI. I believe I am now verified, or at least I paid for it. I don't know if I have my check, yard, check mark yet. I realize that I need the ability to send messages to people and... Some people have it so that unless you're verified, you can't send the messages, which is unfortunate. But we're making moves over there. I want to thank everybody for showing up to this book club. And thank you very much for all your support over this. Hasn't even been a year yet. It's crazy to think that we're already at a thousand subs at less than a year. But everyone's telling us it's well-deserved and they're very proud of us. Thank you so much. We appreciate you guys the absolute most. I mean, would we be talking into the void or the ether? Regardless, yes, good chance, especially for book club. That was my plan, but I'm so happy to have all these beautiful people on the panel and all of you guys showing up in the chat. By the way, this book for me, this is, I like this one a lot. However, I do have to put an asterisk behind it because I think this is some more advanced material when it comes to these concepts. I absolutely think that people, I would like for people to get to the point where this knowledge is useful and practical. However, at the same time, unless you understand some basic concepts before this, this is not really going to help you out a whole lot. However, at the same time, though, good read. I appreciate the perspective. And I, I, I'm a big fan of this version of the Brain Trust or the Truth Seeking Pod. And I think the book is definitely worth it just from that perspective alone. So with that being said, I do want to do a few final shout outs. Charlotte Nightstar Werewolf, thank you for being here. Benny Blanco, you're an absolute Chad showing up to this stream and just providing all the information that you did. Much appreciated, my man. And then we also got Trolling Mulling telling us to hop over to the F and Hangout. Yes, sir. We'll get to that in one second. And we also got uh, Pulse God showing up as well. Good to see you, sir. Alrighty, folks, with that being said, thank you for your time and attention. We know your time is your most valuable asset, so thank you for spending it with us. And until next time, DGEN responsibly.